Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Larry Raff, uh, and I'm the host today, and I'm pleased you can join us, Natalie Martin and myself. <clears throat> Quick introduction, I'm president of Copley Raff, a national fundraising consultancy for nonprofits around fundraising, and the creator of Abacus Major Donor Ask Calculator, which is the uh, sponsor of this webinar series. It is my pleasure and delight to introduce Natalie Martin. Uh, Natalie is currently uh, uh, the uh, a customer success manager at Evertrue, but I know Natalie from her uh, her frontline fundraising role at University of Connecticut School of Medicine, and then at the Seacoast Science Center in Rye, New Hampshire. Uh, Natalie and I uh, we had a professional relationship, became friends, and with the uh, beginning of this web series, I immediately um, thought of her to address this uh, topic. So we're going to do that uh, right now. Participant enabled closed captioning. Okay, I've never done this before. So here we go. So Natalie. Hello. You, hi. I want to put you on the hot seat. Okay, here we go. All right. So so what are what is a philan what is a philanthropy capacity estimate anyway? Great question. Um I would consider a philanthropic capacity estimate to be one tool in the toolbox uh, for fundraisers. Um, as Larry mentioned, I was um, a fundraiser at um, the School of Medicine for the University of Connecticut, um, and I was a fundraiser for 16 years. And so this uh, capacity estimate is just kind of a measure of wealth that we would use to, uh, you know, when we're starting to start to talk to donors and steward them and cultivate them uh, for a gift. Um, it gives you an estimate. I mean, let's be clear here. It's just an estimate. Um, but it takes into account a donor's past giving at not just your organization, but at others that's some political giving in there as well. Um, what it doesn't do is assess what the donor is actually interested in, um, because it just gives a really high level picture. Um, and it's not really a perfect system in that not every gift is public, um, and not every, um, you know, piece of wealth is public. And so, um, while it's a tool certainly that is helpful, uh, it's not um, it's not enough to make you know accurate predictions or or steward or cultivate accurately. You know, I, I've I've uh, always consider it considered them a good tool to uh, assess an entire file, mm -hmm. with thousands of names, and to at least help the fundraiser focus their attention on the cream of the crop, so to speak. Absolutely, the most highly scored people. But at the end of the day, it's sort of a blunt instrument. Yeah, it really is. And it's not something that should be just, you know, taken in a vacuum that, oh, this, okay, now I know how much they're worth. And so now I'm going to ask them for, you know, whatever the amount is that you think about uh, or can drum up uh, and really guess on because, you know, it, it it says what it is right in in the title. It is just an estimate. An estimate. An estimate. You know, I know some of those estimate, a lot of the tools, so the the windfall and donor search and wealth engine and iWave and there's three or four others at so least. Many, yeah. They tend to also use um, real estate values yes. in their estimates, which I've yeah. always found odd, but perhaps you can share what you think about that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, just because someone has uh, you know, has bought a fancy home or has a $4 million house, that doesn't mean that then they have liquid assets to be able to give as a gift. Um, and I'll use myself as an example, which um, just happens to be timely that, you know, we just moved from Connecticut to New Hampshire. And we now, if you, you know, use me as an example and look me up in donor search, at least as of a year ago, it said that I still owned a home in Connecticut and I own a home in New Hampshire. So, According to donor search, I've got a million dollars worth of assets and I could give you a hundred thousand dollar gift over three years, which is not the case at all. Um, and even if I did own those two homes, I mean, I could have a million dollars worth of, of real estate with, you know, nine hundred thousand dollars in mortgage payments. So it doesn't really 
add up to what everybody, you know, what you could actually be asking someone to give. So um, while they might live in a fancy home, that could have been a gift that could have been, again, a high mortgage, you know, not an ideal way to look at how someone can actually spend their money. You know, agreed. I, and <laughs> I'm sure everyone's marking marking you down as a, yes. as a, top, <laughs> as a, top, as a top tier prospect. <clears throat> but what I do see three, four, five pieces of real estate owned by an individual. Sure. Then, then that's real estate investment. Correct. And, and that's a that's a real val that's a real sign of of capacity. Correct. Yep. Good point. You know, versus one or two. And and, and in fact, a lot of people who own multiple pieces of real estate hold it through LLCs and LLCs, limited liability corporations, don't get picked up, as I understand it, by the services. Correct. And that's a good point that there are a, some other, you know, aspects and areas of a person's wealth that is also not getting picked up by donor search and wealth engine and windfall in those. So it's important to do your due diligence and look, you know, at all aspects of the donor before you start to make some real solid asks and questions. Mm -hmm. So I know these services, many of them draw upon the same sources sure. of information yep. you know, and apply their, their unique algorithms to the data. Uh, but you also know, I know that uh, Evershoe uses windfall as, do, yes. as evaluator. Uh, perhaps you can share a little bit about its uniqueness, uh, but also with the understanding that all of the services will will say will give you an idea of where they get their information and talk about why they're special uh, yes. compared, compared to the others. Absolutely. So, so you can yeah. give you can now give an example of what that would be like. Yeah, sure. So yeah, so Evertrue integrates Windfall right into our platform. So. Um, but windfall is, you know, a little bit different in that it harnesses the power of small businesses, that information that's out there on small businesses. Um, and they focus on wealthy homes and neighborhoods versus, uh, or, I'm sorry, wealthy neighborhoods versus wealthy homes. So you're going to get a picture of where that person lives, similar to Larry, how you said, you know, if they have multiple addresses. Um, if they've got multiple fancy addresses, then that's going to be an indicator of net worth. Uh, Windfall says that they use 200 different sources. That's their secret sauce that, uh, you know, that even we don't get to know about, but um, it's just, you know, one piece of uh, the puzzle there. Um, and, you know, depending on, you know, if you have the resources in your organization to be able to pull from, you know, these different wealth engine donor search windfall, uh, you might get kind of an average between, you know, the handful of them, but um, overall, they're going to give you, like I said, just that small piece that then has to fit into the bigger picture of, you know, the donor's affinity um, to your organization and, you know, everything else. That's that's sort of the perfect segue into how do you use yeah. these blunt instruments, as I put it, yes. uh, in, in, in arriving at an amount to ask someone for a major gift. And full disclosure, Natalie was a beta tester for uh, Abacus Major Donor yes. Ask Calculator. And, um, you know, we like to say that Abacus picks up where these estimators leave off in the effort to come up with a number to ask someone for a major gift. So perhaps you can put it all together for us. Sure. Yeah. I, so when I was at um, the Seco Science Center um, in 2021 and early 2022, um, I was a beta tester for Abacus and I had uh, donor search and then I had our database at the time um, and just some historical knowledge. And so when I'm, you know, approaching somebody for a gift, I'm talking to them. I'm certainly figuring out, you know, where their interests lie, what the organization's uh, priorities are in that moment, taking that philanthropic capacity estimate and then putting all of that into the Abacus to then say for that, to then spit out a number for me. Um, the way that the timing worked out, I had made some big asks of some donors at the Science Center and then was able to kind of verify what I had done with Abacus. And it was exact. I mean, the numbers were exact to what I had asked. And then even so far as one of them gave the exact amount that Abacus suggested that I asked them for. Um, and that was a $2.5 million gift. 
Uh, and so that was really affirming in the work that I had done leading up to it. You know, again, like having those conversations, uh, letting the donor talk. Um, you know, Larry and I have talked about this so often that as fundraisers where you ask a few questions and then you sit back and shut up and you let that donor uh, tell you everything that they love about your organization and what they're interested in in their personal lives. And then you, you know, build that. You're not taking the donor's interest and, you know, putting a square peg in a round hole. You're, you're kind of marrying the two of the donor's interests with what, you know, your organization really needs in that moment. Um, and you can't just walk into those meetings with, you know, uh, an oral history and like a, an estimate from donor search. You really need more information than that. You, you really highlighted the importance of one discovery visits yes. and two relationship building so that there are very few questions unanswered when you get to the point of deliberation or about right. an, amount, an amount they ask for. Yeah, you have to do your due diligence. I find that like I, the way that I approach asking a donor for a gift is they shouldn't be surprised at the number. Like I remember when I first started working after college, my boss at the time said to me, you, when I sat down for like a performance review, she said, you shouldn't be surprised at anything that I'm going to say today because we've been talking about it all along. And I feel that same way about asking a donor for a gift that if you are on the right track, if you're asking the right questions, if you've got the right research and information, uh, and that comes from places like Donor Search or Windfall and Abacus, putting it all together um, with the historical knowledge that you have of this donor, then it shouldn't surprise them when you ask them for a number because it should fit right in with what they're thinking too. Well said. You know, not everyone has that luxury, uh, you know, when you're particularly when you're in campaign. Yep. So what I what I counsel is when you do arrive at an ask amount and you make the ask, <clears throat> always close the statement with, and Natalie, if I haven't asked you for enough, please tell me. Yes. And what happens is appreciate that. Yeah, they appreciate it. What happens is they they all they one hundred percent of the time they smile or giggle or laugh, yes. right? <laughs> Yep. And you always want people in a good mood when you're thinking about something you just asked them to do, particularly around money. Yes. But and but also don't assume you've gotten it right. And right. You know, I'd say about 20% of the time, folks had a bigger number in mind. It's than true. I had asked for it. Yep. Yeah. You, you don't want to leave money on the table. No. Right? And I've been met with that same smile and that same giggle. And sometimes it's, oh, I was thinking about this number, which is bigger. Or sometimes it's, oh, that's exactly what I was thinking. I literally once in my entire career as a fundraiser did one donor when I was at the University of Connecticut say, that is not what I was thinking at all. And he cut that amount in half, but even still it was half. It's not what, you know, I asked him for a million, he gave me 500,000. That's not a bad day. Uh, and he wasn't offended either. And that's the difference. That's because the difference. That's my work. It's funny too when when you're doing an ask, and if you have a consultant with you who has been in the, been in the mix, you know during during the effort, if the number come, if you ask for a big number and the donor thinks it's like a really big number, you can always blame it on the consultant. It's <laughs> a good point. <laughs> uh, you know, I've had donors actually point to me and say, "Is that is, did you come up with that?" You know, Larry told me to ask. I don't that, know. That, that's right. That's right. <laughs> So, um, so just to put a fine point on it, sure. These, these philanthropic capacity estimates are what a donor is capable of giving to all nonprofits right. over a three to five year period, depending on the service. Yeah. And that's like, I think that's a good point to make is that it's over a three to five year period. Like we're not talking about here, like that donor, you know, that estimate is not going to spit out to you and say, you know, Larry can give $100,000 this year and next year and the year after. This is spanned over a couple of years. Um, and another point too, that when you said, you know, it's what they can give to everybody. So they have an alma mater, they might have a graduate degree, they have a spouse. And we all know on this call that women are the ones that are making philanthropic decisions by and large in families. And so if you're looking up a gentleman, unlikely that he's going to be the one making the decisions, even though it might, you know, the money might be hit, who knows uh, how it goes in that family. But 
Um, yeah, I'm glad I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> But that's, you know, that's a good point is that if you, you know, add it all up and you see, you know, from if, you know, windfall spits out something to you or donor search that says, you know, so-and-so gave a hundred thousand dollars over like 15 different organizations last year, that doesn't mean they're going to give you a hundred thousand dollars. You've got to do the work still, uh, and figuring out, you know, what their affinity is to your organization. Mm -hmm. Um, how connected are they? What have you done to connect them to your organization? That's the biggest thing. Sure, that relationship building is so, so important. Huge. And also, I want to make the point that being able to integrate one of these services with your database. Yes. So that the wealth score <clears throat> can be part of the record in the database. Yes. Is, is I mean, I, I know that Evershoe does that. Uh, we, yeah. fall, and it's, it's it's really important to be able to do that so that it's all in the database. You know, the, the, is this, the database is the center of the world. Yes. Yeah. And it's, I mean, you're only as good as the data that you're putting in there. And what's wonderful about Evertrue and why I purchased it and used it at the Seco Science Center is because it layers on top of your database. It pulls all of that information and then it adds all this other stuff. So you get Facebook data and LinkedIn data and Realtor.com or oh. Zilla, rather data. And, you know, like I said, in Windfall, um, it gives you a donor potential score. It gives you all of these things. Uh, but windfall is a big piece of that because it gives these estimates. But then there's still that missing link. I mean, even when I had it, I still didn't, I still was guessing on that dollar amount. Um, and so being able to validate after the fact or use in advance abacus was tremendous. What if someone doesn't have access to? one of these wealth estimators oh, and they have a major question. donor program and a major gift program. Uh, and, you know, and Abacus does um, require a number, uh, uses the low end of the range that's provided by these services, a right. the low number. But if you don't have one of these services, what do you, what's your advice to folks in that situation? It's a good question. And I would say that even if you do have it, you still want to utilize your board um, as best you can. And so something that we did that from um, that was highly suggested and recommended from uh, Larry's team when I started at the Science Center was doing some board capacity screening. Uh, so pulling a list of your highest donors or, you know, people in the area of your organization uh, that you would you know, have been interested or you would like to them to be interested in your organization sit down with your board and have them, you know, scale on a one to five scale. One, you, they, you know, don't know them at all. Five, they know them really well and they know that they could give in some way. And then start to figure out from your, uh, from your board and other volunteers, maybe even the leadership team of your organization, do they know if that person has given at other organizations in your area? Perhaps they might have a little bit more insight into that person's phil philanthropic capacity. Maybe they you know, send their kids to the same private school, whatever it is, whatever kind of street research you can glean from the folks uh, that are in your organization's orbit uh, to be able to then, yeah, take a, that number, any kind of, you know, an estimate that you can, um, that you kind of have to home grow to uh, put into Abacus, anything will be helpful. But uh, I found the board uh, to be really, really helpful in that situation. And volunteers, long-term volunteers, if you're a smaller organization, they know everybody, everybody that walks through those doors. I call that street research. Yep. <clears throat> and yeah, you know, I value that, frankly, more than the estimators, because I've seen uh, I've seen now that Abacus is in the field and people are using it. I've seen where they put in that the wealth estimator gave a twenty five thousand plus uh, rating and the person's largest gift to another organization was a million dollars. There you go. See? But they're rated at twenty five to fifty thousand. Uh, so the people who know that donor know Correct. their capacity is much more than twenty five to fifty thousand dollars. So the street research is centrally important, whether or not right you have, you have uh, a wealth estimate. Yeah, absolutely, service. invaluable. But I'm going to take a uh, a point of privilege, and 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 share with folks um let's see where, where am i here just a little bit about 
abacus while you're all uh, thinking about the questions you want to ask Natalie and I, yes. uh, and put that in the chat. Now, as we talked about, you, you're a gift officer, you've gathered all this information about the donor, and now what? You've got to come up with a number to ask for. There's personal biases involved on your relationship to money, <clears throat> institutional self-esteem. Uh, the, sometimes, as I just described, the wealth estimates can be a little wonky. Uh, there's analysis paralysis. Do I have enough information? When do I have enough? Uh, when, when, when do I need more? And, and then all that just feeds a lack of confidence in that sense that you're shooting from the hip. So what Abacus brings to the table is a bias-free result. Uh, it does not, it's all, it's all objective information and binary answers to questions, only 21 questions that a smart wizard pulls you through. As you see here to the right, it gives you a readiness score. So you don't have analysis paralysis. It tells you if you've got enough or not. Uh, it gives you an aspirational ask amount and a goal. Ask 39 or 40 to get 30. And uh, you can also, in addition to using it with individual donors, you can run your whole portfolio or pipeline through it and use this pledge goal amount as um, a pretty accurate number because right now that pledge goal against actual pledges is within 2%. So Perfect. Natalie, you, you, you experience coming in right on the nose on a $2 million gift, but we're, yep. we're, we're within 2%. It's been validated by more than 400 gift offices over the last five years through, uh, through my work with clients. Uh, people can find it at donoravocus.com for a free trial, but I want to show you the data. Here's an actual pledge. This is what Abacus's goal amount was. The ask amount was 25% higher, but look at this. The wealth estimate was 88% below actual pledge. Similarly, here's where the wealth estimator was 150% above actual pledge, where Abacus was 13%. And if you rolled all of the profiles together, Abacus is within 2% and the wealth estimators are 250% off of actual pledges. That's wild. So, something that um, I was talking with a researcher at the Lilly School uh, uh, for Philanthropy. And I asked, I asked him, I said, Bill, has anybody done any research on wealth estimators against actual pledges? You know, how do they compare? Right. Uh, and he, he knew of no such research. And I've asked others and people who run consultancies and, and, and fundraisers like yourselves, no one has heard of such a, such a collection of information. Well, I'm doing that now. And we're going to have a pretty large data set soon uh, to be able to um, convey to the to the right. uh, to the industry. It's remarkable that we've been relying on this these estimates, and they can be off by that high of a percentage. Yeah, it's remarkable. And just thinking about <laughs> what having accurate estimates and accurate numbers and accurate ask amounts will do for relationship building. Um, that you're, you know, you won't be annoying or pissing off your donors, excuse my language, but like it, it, it's point. really going to make a big difference. A very good point. I, I like to tell the story that, you know, Nat Natalie, uh, uh, you're, you're the donor and I ask you for a million dollar gift and you are kind and say, Larry, you know, thank you. I'll give that some consideration and get back to you. And then you call up my boss. And you say, you know, Mary, what is Larry smoking? Where did he come up with a million dollars? Right. Right. And so Mary comes to me and says, Larry, where did you get that number? And if I didn't have Abacus or something like it to justify the number. Right. Then it becomes a mess. Yes. Big time. Yeah. All yeah. the way around. Right? Absolutely. You need rigor. Is my point is you need rigor. And of all the trainings and all the gift officers I've talked to, the 400 plus I told you about before, 
I asked the question, how many of you have a formal process for arriving at an amount to ask for? Two people have raised their hands. Wow. I was going to say it's probably zero. Right. Yeah. yeah, I know. I didn't as a gift officer. There's no there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's just it's just guessing. It's I mean, you build certainly some intuition as you go, you know, as you grow in your career, but for for new donors, for discovery officers, for you know, folks that are just starting out, even again, like I I was in my 16th year of fundraising when I used Abacus and it was so validating to know that I was doing right by my donors. That's the best part. That's the best part. Well, it looks as though our audience does not, do not have questions for us. All right. We were just that good. Larry. We were just that good. We covered it all. <laughs> So I'm, we're going to give everyone back uh, uh, 15 minutes of your day. Uh, I'll be uh, emailing uh, a link to the recording of this uh, tomorrow. And Natalie, I want to thank you very much for for co-hosting this and everyone else for joining us today. Thanks, Larry. Bye, Enjoy everyone. Enjoy your day, everyone. <laughs>